course you have. How many of us have needed to start over? Whether it is just the beginning of a new day and saying, I'm so glad I'm alive, I'm ready to tackle a new day's work, a new day's challenges, to be with my loved ones and to be a better human being. Yes, how great it is to start over. And sometimes you need to start over when there's a new chapter in your life, a new season. Hey, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to discern something new and great in my life. I'm ready for a change. I want to start over. Sometimes life is hard. Life is unfair. Things do not go as you'd expect it, and sometimes people are treated so unjustly that the very best thing that they can imagine is walking away from all of it and saying, I am just going to start over. And sometimes we need to start over because there's no other way to repair a relationship. To ask somebody, can I please start over, is asking them really for the world, a new world, between you and them. Can I start over? I love that. Jesus says to his disciples, if another member of the church sins against you, work with that person one-on-one. -on -one. And if that one who has so deeply offended you doesn't listen to you, well then, bring two or three folks along. Maybe you can figure it out. And if even after two or three of your fellow Christians are not able to be present to this one who has so hurt you and offended you, and if you guys can't all sort it out, then take it to the church and see if it can be worked out there. And if you can't work it out there, then let that one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Such a teaching on one level asks for a great deal of forbearance, patience, with someone who is clearly at odds with a fellow Christian. I've said to you many, many, many times, I have so deeply felt the presence of God in my life, in the lives of people who have put up with me while I've grown up or matured or have figured things out so that I can finally get my act together and be the person I need to be. God's been present and alive to me in those ways sometimes more than anything else. People have put up with me and given me space and time and I've been able to hear most of the time that that's God talking. That's God speaking to me in the life of that relationship, in the life of that person. I better listen because I'm getting to start over. So forbearance and patience and long-suffering and endurance and kindness are some of the things which are powerful in the church. Most powerful, in fact, many people remember exactly those kinds of experiences. Some people sadly take advantage of them. And some people are just so not able to allow another person's words and feelings and thoughts to enter into their reality. They will have nothing to do with them. And that happens way too long. So Jesus continues to invite this experience of long-suffering and endurance and patience with everybody, ultimately, with the whole church. You do not find the word church in any other gospel other than Matthew's gospel. Ecclesia is that Greek word, this wonderful world, which initially started off simply as a very civic and secular word. The ecclesia was simply the town crier calling out to all the citizens to come out to the town square so that some kind of democratic action could take place. Some act of the people could be summoned up. Ecclesia just means an assembly, a congregation, a gathering. But, in the words of the church, as we hear it today, in the gospel life, who is it that does the calling but the Holy Spirit of God? Who is it that does the calling but Jesus across the villages and down the roads and the countryside and in the great city of Jerusalem? Who summons, who calls but Him? He 
calls people out from their lives of brokenness and sin and apathy. He calls people out from every corner of the world into a gathering that is unlike any other. And so if anyone has heard the voice of Jesus, if anyone has responded to the voice of the Spirit and has gone into great ecclesia, this great gathering, this great assembly, they have had a change of heart. They have gotten to start over. They know what it feels like. Imagine a whole group of people gathered together, just like this one. And the Lord can look at each of us. And we can look within ourselves and we can say, you all know what it's like to start over. You know. And you have to hang on to that when fellow Christians are difficult and when times are tough. So Jesus says, well, if the whole gathering of people who've got to start over can't help y'all figure this out, this great offense, this great difference, this great conflict, then let that one, assuming it's totally one-sided, let that one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. If I were to be a selfish jerk of a Christian, I would say, that's the end of that issue. I'm so glad they went away. But I do not believe that is what Jesus said. Who does Jesus reach out to but the Gentiles and the prostitutes and the tax collectors, the most unloved, the most insignificant, the most unimportant, the demon-possessed, the crippled, the useless? Who does Jesus reach out to but all of those folks who we assume just should have a big wall between us and them? Let such a person be to you as a Gentile and tax collector, Jesus says, because then you and they get to start over again. They get to start over. They are your new mission field. If they are Gentiles again, if they are tax collectors again, if they are prostitutes again, if they are insignificant and unimportant again, you, church, you, the gathering, you get to start over again. That's, I think, what Jesus means. That is what I believe Jesus means when he teaches in this way. I had to laugh this past week. A little article came out in Salon.com, which questioned the historical existence of anyone like Jesus of Nazareth. These articles show up every once in a blue moon. It's kind of funny. And of course, they kept it up on their front page much longer than they keep any of their other stories because it was gathering so much commentary and circulating so widely. The number of folks pushed it onto my Facebook feed and so on and so forth. And I thought to myself, you know, I mean, fine, if you want to think that, go ahead. Um, questioning whether this man ever existed. And that's fine, I suppose, if that's where you want to go. And how strange it would be that anybody would ever desire to do what has just been called us to do. If such a one did not exist. If such a one did not exist to motivate us, you and me, motivate centuries and centuries of people. To start over and over and over and over again with God, the most unloved, the most uncared for, the most unimportant of people. What motivated them to suddenly say, God's alive in my life, but this one who healed them, called them by name to new life to purity of soul and spirit and body. What would any of these insignificant followers of Jesus have done? What would they have said?
set in motion? What would Paul have experienced if it had not been for this one who spoke to each of them and said, I need you for the kingdom of God. I'm calling you out of your old life to a new life. Where would we be, gathered church? Where would we be if we do not have this one who says to us again and again, you can start over, and you must be with those who must start over again and again. Put up with them. Love them. Seek the wisdom of friends and family. Seek the gathered wisdom of the church. To deal with all the suffering and the pain of this world. So that the church can do what God has authorized it to do. What Jesus first says to Peter and the disciples, he now says to all of them. If you bind it up here on earth, it'll be bound up in heaven. It'll, it's going to be set loose on earth. It's going to be set loose in heaven. If you bind up all this conflict and say it's no longer going to have any power over us, it doesn't have any power up there. And if we say that we are no longer going to allow the lusts of privilege and power to reign over our hearts, for greed and privilege to infest our souls, if we are going to say we want that tied up and left to die, so it shall be in heaven. And if we say together, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we want to set love loose in the world, endurance, compassion, patience, we want to set that out into this world, so it shall be in heaven. What a powerful authority we have when it's in the service of the Holy Spirit. Amazing things can be tied up and beautiful things can be let loose in this world. We who are the gathered body now get to do the calling out and the crying out to the world. That's our 